Get Gotti basically deals with the story of how the FBI finally took down mob boss John Gotti. It's interesting because the Netflix documentary tells the story from two sides, one of those sides belonging to law enforcement and members of the mob who worked closely with Gotti and could offer insight into everything that was going down at the time. Having said that, several elements of this story are either glossed over or missing entirely, as the streaming platform appears to have hidden parts of the story of John Gotti. Here are five of them. Gotti's Rise to Power Yet Gotti started in the mid-80s, with John Gotti having already taken out his predecessor Paul Castellano in late 1985. That was a defining moment in his life, as he took control of the Gambino crime family. However, Gotti's journey of establishing himself first as an associate, and then as a captain in the crew, is just as compelling, because it helps us to understand just where he was coming from. In the gritty streets of the Bronx, New York, John Gotti was born into a world of poverty and struggle in 1940. Growing up in a working-class Italian-American neighborhood, Gotti quickly learned the harsh realities of life. But it was here that he also discovered the allure of the streets and the power that came with a life of crime. At a young age, Gotti found himself drawn to the world of organized crime. He began running errands for local mobsters and soon became involved in small-time criminal activities. It didn't take long for Gotti to prove his worth, displaying a natural talent for making money and gaining respect within the criminal underworld. As he grew older, Gotti's reputation as a skilled earner caught the attention of the Gambino crime family, one of the most powerful mafia organizations in New York City. Recognizing his potential, the family took Gotti under their wing, providing him with opportunities to climb the ranks and establish himself as a force to be reckoned with. Gotti's rise within the Gambino family was swift and relentless. He quickly became one of the biggest earners, involved in various criminal enterprises, including loan sharking, illegal gambling, and drug trafficking. Gotti's ability to generate wealth and his unwavering loyalty to the family earned him favor and respect among his peers. But it wasn't just his criminal activities that set Gotti apart. He had a unique sense of style and charisma that captivated those around him. With his impeccably tailored suits, flashy jewelry, and slicked back hair, Gotti exuded an air of confidence and power that drew people to him. He became known as the Dapper Don, a moniker that perfectly captured his suave and sophisticated persona. That's a lot of information to swallow in just a couple of minutes, so let me break it down a little bit. In the gritty streets of East New York, Brooklyn, a young John Gotti found himself drawn into a life of crime at an early age. As a teenager, he became a leader of a local gang known as the Fulton Rockaway Boys, where he quickly gained a reputation for his street smarts and fearlessness. It was during this time that Gotti's path intersected with the notorious Gambino crime family, one of New York City's most powerful and feared criminal organizations. Gotti's charisma and natural leadership abilities caught the attention of the Gambino family, who saw potential in the young upstart. They recognized his street savvy and ability to command respect from his peers. It wasn't long before Gotti was initiated into the world of organized crime, becoming a trusted associate of the Gambino family. As Gotti's involvement with the Gambino crime family deepened, he began to understand the power and influence that came with being part of such a notorious organization. He quickly learned the inner workings of the criminal underworld, navigating the complex web of alliances, rivalries, and illicit activities that defined the mob. But Gotti's ambitions didn't stop there. He had his sights set on climbing the ranks of the Gambino family, eager to make a name for himself and leave his mark on the criminal world. With his natural charm and magnetic personality, Gotti quickly gained the trust and respect of his superiors, including the family's leader, Carlo Gambino. However, Gotti's rise through the ranks was not without its challenges. He faced constant scrutiny from law enforcement, who were determined to bring down the powerful Gambino family. Gotti's involvement in criminal activities brought him into frequent conflict with the law, resulting in a string of arrests for petty crimes. Between the ages of 18 and 26, Gotti found himself in and out of jail, facing charges ranging from theft to assault. Despite these setbacks, Gotti's reputation continued to grow within the criminal underworld. His ability to navigate the legal system and avoid serious consequences earned him the nickname the Teflon Don. As criminal, charges seemed to slide off him without sticking. In 1968, Gotti's criminal activities took a more serious turn when he was arrested by agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation (FBI) on charges of truck hijacking and cargo theft. He pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to three years in a federal prison.
prison. This marked a turning point in Gotti's life, as he realized the importance of maintaining connections and influence even behind bars. During his time in prison, Gotti's reputation continued to grow. He allegedly bribed prison officials and guards, allowing him to leave the Greenhaven Correctional Facility in upstate New York. These unauthorized outings provided Gotti with the opportunity to meet with other mobsters at New York City restaurants and even visit his home in the Howard Beach section of Queens. It was during these secret meetings that Gotti solidified his position within the Gambino family and forged alliances that would prove crucial to his future success. Gotti's mentor, Agnello Della Croce, recognized his potential and took him under his wing. Della Croce, who controlled nearly half of the syndicate, saw Gudi as a protege and groomed him for leadership. Under Della Croce's tutelage, Gotti honed his skills as a mobster, learning the intricacies of the criminal underworld and gaining the respect of his peers. Della Croce's importance to the events of 1985 was far more important than just offering Gotti guidance. As the story goes, before Carlo Gambino passed away, he named his brother-in-law, Paul Castellano, as his successor to lead the family. But there was a small issue here. Gotti's mentor, Della Croce, was supposed to be next in line. Castellano wasn't just some guy, he was a made man too. But in the eyes of Della Croce and Gotti, he was the enemy, at least to an extent. However, the fact that Gotti waited until Della Croce had died to attack Castellano just proved that the dapper Don always intended to incite violence and assume his spot at the head of the table instead of ever handing it off to his mentor, Paul Castellano's path to succession. I want to take a little while to talk about Paul Castellano because beyond just being a catalyst for John Gotti's rise to further fame and notoriety, Castellano's journey ran parallel to Gotti's and added a little more depth to this entire story. Born to Sicilian immigrant parents, Castellano's journey began in the early 1900s. His father, a butcher, instilled in him the values of hard work and loyalty. Little did they know that these very values would shape Castellano's future in the world of organized crime. Growing up in a tight-knit Italian-American community, Castellano's path would soon intertwine with that of his cousin, Carlo Gambino, a rising mobster in the Mangano crime family. The ties of kinship would prove to be a powerful force, as Castellano's sister would later marry Gambino himself. As Castellano entered adulthood, he followed in his father's footsteps and became a butcher. However, his association with organized crime continued to grow, fueled by his connection to Gambino and the expanding Mangano crime family, which would eventually become the notorious Gambino family. Castellano's reputation within the family grew, and in 1957, he attended the infamous Appalachian Meeting, a gathering of high-ranking mobsters from across the United States. At just 42 years old, he was one of the youngest attendees, a testament to his rising influence within the criminal underworld. However, Castellano's involvement in organized crime was not without its consequences. During the Appalachian Meeting, the police intervened, leading to arrests and convictions. Castellano, true to the code of silence, refused to provide information, resulting in a conviction for contempt of court and a seven-month imprisonment. Despite these setbacks, Castellano's loyalty and dedication to the family did not go unnoticed. When Carlo Gambino, the head of the Gambino family, passed away in 1976, he chose Castellano as his successor, bestowing upon him the title of Boss of Bosses, or the Godfather. As Paul Castellano settled into his role as the boss of the Gambino family, his power and influence reached unprecedented heights. From his opulent mansion on Staten Island, he orchestrated a vast criminal empire that extended its reach into every corner of New York City. Castellano's organization infiltrated labor unions, ensuring their control over various industries such as construction and food supply. Legitimate businesses were forced to pay extortionate sums of money, while traditional rackets like gambling, pornography, and loan sharking continued to thrive under his watchful eye. However, Castellano's leadership was not without its quirks. Despite the allure of immense profits, he disapproved of drug trafficking within his organization. The fear of harsh legal penalties and the potential for betrayal from accused perpetrators kept him steadfast in his decision to keep drugs out of the Gambino family's operations, but Castellano's reign would soon be tested. In February 1985, he and eight other high-ranking mobsters were indicted under the Federal Racketeer-Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, better known as RICO. The charges alleged their involvement in a commission that governed organized crime in New York City. However, before the RICO trial could take place, Castellano and other members of the Gambino family faced prosecution in another federal trial. U.S. Attorney Rudolph 
Rudolf Giuliani charged them with running a large-scale car theft ring that shipped stolen cars overseas and had committed 25 murders. The car theft trial was still in progress on December 16, 1985, when tragedy struck. Castellano, accompanied by his newly appointed underboss, Thomas Bellotti, arrived at a steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan. But as they stepped out of their car, they were mercilessly gunned down in the street. We know that this was Gotti's doing, and that the last bit about Castellano's murder was covered in the documentary. We also know that Gotti became the dapper Don and captured the imaginations of people. But when you take a look at both men's rise to power, it is pretty easy to see that Castellano was the more qualified fit for the role. His close standing with Carlo Gambino for pretty much the entirety of his life meant that he was always going to have a deeper, more profound understanding of what his predecessor would have wanted for the family. That was why Castellano maintained a focus on more white-collar businesses, as opposed to giving drug trafficking operations the green light. Reportedly, one of the main reasons Carlo Gambino even gave Castellano the seat was because he wanted exactly that. What remains undeniable is the impact of Castellano's leadership and the legacy he left behind. The rise and fall of Paul Castellano, the godfather of the Gambino family, remains a captivating chapter in the annals of organized crime. His leadership, marked by both ruthless control and unexpected moral boundaries, left an indelible mark on the criminal underworld. A lot of this nuance is lost in Get Gotti, which foregoes depth for a series of talking heads that jump around from one segment to the other, creating a more stylized product that sacrifices substance for shine. This meant that one of the most daring and unsolved cash heists ever, the Lufthansa heist never got the shine it deserved either. John Gotti's criminal activities and rise to power were marked by audacity, ruthlessness, and an unwavering pursuit of dominance. His ability to outmaneuver law enforcement and maintain control over the Gambino crime family made him a legendary figure in the annals of organized crime. While his reign may have come to an end, the name John Gotti will forever be synonymous with the dark underbelly of the American criminal underworld. With that in mind, putting a highlight on some of his most daring crimes only feels right, don't you think? After all, this is a story that saw a daring heist go down at JFK Airport, with the alleged involvement of the Lucchese crime family, a getaway driver refusing to follow orders, and it is the longest investigated crime in American history. The most recent arrest was made back in 2014, and it resulted in an acquittal. It really is a story for the ages. John Gotti and the Largest Ever Cash Robbery On December 11, 1978, a group of masked, armed men linked to the Lucchese crime family executed the largest theft of currency ever committed on American soil at the Lufthansa Airlines cargo terminal in New York's John F. Kennedy International Airport. In just 64 minutes, they managed to steal a staggering $5.8 million in cash and jewels, leaving authorities baffled and the public in awe. No shots were fired, and no one was seriously hurt or killed during the heist. However, what makes this heist even more astonishing is the fact that the stolen cash and jewels were never recovered, adding an air of mystery to an already shocking crime. It all began with a tip. Louis Werner, a Lufthansa cargo supervisor, noticed something that piqued his interest. Stacks of untraceable bills were frequently flown in from Germany and temporarily stored at the airline's JFK vault. Werner saw an opportunity, and he approached Martin Krugman, a bookmaker, with his idea. Little did they know that this seemingly innocent conversation would set in motion one of the most insane heists in American history. Krugman, intrigued by Werner's tip, wasted no time in passing it along to his associate, Henry Hill. Hill, a gangster with ties to the Lucchese crime family, recognized the potential of this heist. He knew just the man to bring on board, his mentor, Jimmy the Gent Burke. Burke was notorious for his involvement in hijackings and robberies of cargo trucks coming from the airport. With his expertise and connections, Burke assembled a crew of hijackers, killers, loan sharks, and thieves ready to pull off the heist of a lifetime. The planning took place in Burke's gambling and criminal hangout in Queens. The crew meticulously studied the layout of the Lufthansa cargo terminal, identifying weaknesses and devising a foolproof plan. They knew they had to act swiftly and efficiently to avoid detection. Every detail was carefully considered, from disabling the alarm system to herding the employees into the break room at gunpoint. On the night of December 11, 1978, the crew put their plan into action. Armed and masked, they stormed into the Lufthansa cargo terminal during a graveyard shift. The element of surprise was on their side as they swiftly took control of the situation. The employees, terrified and helpless, were forced into the break room while the crew disabled the alarm system, ensuring they had enough time to carry out their daring heist. With the alarm system disabled, the crew made their way to the storage vault. They knew exactly where to find the stacks of untraceable bills and the valuable jewels. In just 64 minutes, they managed to steal a staggering $5 million in untraceable bills and $800,000 worth of jewels. The sheer boldness and efficiency of their operation left everyone stunned. But the heist was far from over. The crew had to ensure a smooth get
getaway and the safe transfer of the loot. They had planned for every possible scenario, including the need to transfer the stolen cash and jewels to other cars at a warehouse owned by none other than John Gotti, a rising star in the world of organized crime. As the crew made their escape, they left behind a trail of terrified employees and a cargo terminal in chaos. The audacity of their actions was matched only by their ability to disappear into the night, leaving authorities scrambling to piece together what had just happened. And so, the Lufthansa heist came to a close, at least in terms of the actual robbery. Little did anyone know that this audacious crime was just the beginning of a series of events that would shock the nation and leave a trail of bodies and disappearances in its wake. The blood would begin to spill, and it would start with Martin Krugman, the bookmaker who had initially received the tip about the untraceable bills. Krugman had been complaining too loudly about his share of the stolen cash, and the crew decided to silence him. They killed and dismembered him, leaving no trace of his existence. Another victim was Parnell Stax Edwards, a member of the crew who had failed to take the getaway van to the junkyard as planned. Burke saw him as a liability and decided to eliminate him. Edwards was found dead, a bullet in his head, executed for his mistake. That junkyard belonged to John Gotti, but Edwards went into business for himself and paid for it with his life. But the crew's thirst for blood didn't stop there. Burke targeted his former cellmate Louis Roast Beef Cafora and his wife Joanna. The couple had been laundering the heist money, and Burke feared they would become a liability. The Cafora's disappeared without a trace. Their bodies were never found. The crew's criminal activities didn't go unnoticed by rival criminals either. Robert McMahon and Joe Buda Manry, two cargo thieves who had crossed paths with the crew, were found dead, shot in the head execution style. It was a clear message from the underworld, a warning to those who dared to interfere. The heist had also attracted the attention of Sicilian drug drug trafficker Paolo Licastri. He saw an opportunity to profit from the chaos and attempted to muscle in on the stolen loot. But his greed proved to be his downfall. Licastri was found burned and bullet riddled, a grim reminder of the dangers that lurked in the criminal underworld. The crew's audacious actions didn't just claim the lives of those directly involved. Innocent bystanders were also caught in the crossfire. Richard Eaton and Tom Monteleone, restaurant owners who had been skimming from the heist cash laundered through their businesses, were killed for their betrayal. The web of violence and deceit continued to unravel. Teresa Ferrara, accused of being involved in the skimming scheme, washed ashore in New Jersey. Her lifeless body served as a chilling reminder of the consequences of getting entangled in the world of organized crime. The crew's reign of terror even extended to their own ranks. Tommy Two Guns. De Simone, a member of the crew, was shot in the head by John Gotti himself. De Simone had committed the grave mistake of murdering two Gambino crime family members without permission, a move that sealed his fate. The Lufthansa heist was a testament to the boldness and ruthlessness of the criminals involved. It showcased just how structured and coordinated organized crime could be and the length some would go to for wealth and power. The stolen cash and jewels were never recovered, leaving a lingering mystery that continues to fascinate to this day. Gotti's involvement in the entire thing simply added to his legend with each passing year the case went unsolved. But just a couple of years after being a part of one of the craziest heists of all time, Gotti would have to contend with a brutal personal loss that would lead to even more bloodshed, the death of Frank Gotti. It was a typical day in the close-knit neighborhood of Howard Beach, Queens. John Favara, a decent and hard-working man, lived on 86th Street with his wife Janet and their two adopted children. Their back fence neighbors were none other than John and Victoria Gotti, parents of five children, including Frank Gotti, the middle son. Despite their different lifestyles, the Gotti and Favara families had a connection. John Favara's son, Scott, was a close friend of Junior Gotti, the oldest of the three Gotti boys. They often spent time together, enjoying the simple pleasures of childhood. On March 18, 1980, tragedy struck the Gotti and Favara families. Frank Gotti, just 12 years old, had made the football team at his school. Filled with excitement, he couldn't wait to share the news with his friends and ride his minibike around the neighborhood. The tween borrowed a minibike from a neighbor kid named Kevin McMahon and began buzzing up and down the streets and sidewalks. The joy on his face was evident as he reveled in the freedom of riding an engine-powered vehicle. Six blocks from home, tragedy struck. Frank Gotti motored through a home renovation job site on 157. Avenue, where a construction dumpster was parked at the curb. Unbeknownst to him, a blind spot created by the sun's glare awaited him just beyond the dumpster. In a split second, Frank Gotti rode his minibike into the street, directly into the path of John Favara's car. The setting sun's blinding glare made it impossible for Favara to see the young boy in time to avoid the collision. The impact was devastating. The neighborhood was thrown into chaos as locals witnessed the horrific accident. Frank Gotti was hit by the car and dragged down the street, pinned beneath it. Desperate cries for Favara 
Guevara to stop filled the air, but he remained unaware of the tragedy unfolding behind him. The young child's body was unfortunately dragged nearly 200 feet on 87th Street. In the days following the accident, the neighborhood was filled with shock and grief. The community rallied around the Gotti family, offering condolences and support during this difficult time. Victoria Frank's mother allegedly demanded an eye for an eye, with it being reported that just two days after the accident, a woman called the police station and informed them Favara would be eliminated. Matters escalated further when he began receiving death threats, all while Victoria glared a hole through him before clubbing him with a baseball bat on May 28th. This is where things are a little murky. Some accounts suggest she hit him with a bat. Others state that she confronted Favara with a bat who just smiled at her before she destroyed the car that murdered her son. Either way, matters were escalating at a rapid rate. On July 25th, John Gotti and his wife left New York for a vacation in Florida under the guise of grieving in sunnier conditions. It was during this time that John Favara mysteriously vanished on July 28th, never to be seen again. After he disappeared without a trace, the neighborhood of Howard Beach was left in shock and speculation. The absence of any concrete evidence or body only fueled the rumors and theories surrounding his disappearance. Authorities launched an investigation into the disappearance, but their efforts yielded little results. Despite interviews and searches, there was no breakthrough in the case. The lack of evidence made it difficult to determine what had truly happened to him. Given John Gotti's rising prominence in the New York Mafia, many speculated that his involvement in organized crime played a role in Favara's disappearance. It was believed that the Gotti family sought revenge for the death of their son and orchestrated Favara's demise. Over the years, various rumors and theories emerged regarding John Favara's fate. Some claimed that he was buried in a Mafia graveyard in Ozone Park, while others believed he was entombed in concrete and dumped at sea. The prevailing version suggested that mobster Charles Carneglia dissolved Favara's remains in a barrel of acid in his macabre basement workshop. It was also rumored that John Gotti's brother, Gene Gotti, was among the mobsters involved in the abduction and murder of John Favara. However, these claims have never been proven, and the truth remains elusive. The Gotti family has maintained their own version of events, embellishing details to suit their rationalizations of Favara's murder. They claim that Favara was drunk and speeding at the time of the accident, dragging Frank Gotti for a significant distance before finally stopping. Despite the Gotti family's claims, the police investigation concluded that the driver, John Favara, had done nothing wrong. Authorities determined that Frank Gotti had ridden his minibike into the street, and Favara had little chance to swerve or avoid the collision. Frank Gotti's sister, also named Victoria, has been vocal about her perspective on the events. She wrote, It's human nature to want revenge against someone that hurts those you love. I only wish Favara had shown some remorse, some respect. I believe he would be alive today if he had. Victoria claims that Favara's lack of remorse and respect led to his tragic fate. Despite the various accounts and rumors, the truth about John Favara's disappearance remains a mystery. His fate may never be fully known, as his remains have never been found. The Gotti family has maintained their silence, leaving the case unsolved and shrouded in speculation. But John Gotti's wife's comment when she was questioned about the murder is telling. She said, I don't know what happened to him, but I'm not sorry if something did. He never sent me a card. He never apologized. He never even got his car fixed. The disappearance of John Favara had a profound impact on his family. His widow, Janet, passed away in 2000, never knowing the truth about her husband's fate. Their son, Scott, has battled with the warped idea that his father deserved the Gotti-inspired termination. Left without a grave to visit on Father's Day for over 30 years, Scott continues to grapple with the loss of his father and the unanswered questions surrounding his disappearance. He has spoken out about his father's character, describing him as a great man, more than anyone would ever know. Sammy the Bull takes down Gotti. Despite weaseling his way out of several trials in the 1980s, thanks to illegal witness tampering, intimidation, and monetary bribes, Gotti, also known as the Teflon Don, seemed untouchable. But the FBI, relentless in their pursuit of justice, continued to build cases against him. And it was during this time that they secured the help of Gotti's once loyal associates, including Sammy the Bull Gravano. Gravano, known for his involvement in the Gambino crime family, started his criminal career as an associate for the Colombo crime family. Family. However, his ambitions led him to join forces with a faction of the Gambino family, where he quickly aligned himself with Gotti, the future head of the syndicate, as well as other notable mobsters, such as Angelo Ruggiero, Frank DeSico, and Joseph Armone. It was this group of Gambino associates that eventually helped Gotti carry out the audacious assassination of Paul Castellano in 1985. With the Gambino boss successfully eliminated, Gotti assumed control of the syndicate and rewarded Gravano for his contributions to the hit. Gravano's loyalty and dedication did not go unnoticed, and he was promoted to the position of captain, and eventually, a consigliere, becoming a trusted advisor and mediator within the organization. By the late 80s, Gravano had risen
risen to the rank of underboss in the Gambino crime family, solidifying his position as one of the most powerful figures in New York's organized crime world. However, tensions began to simmer between Gravano and Gotti, leading to a shocking turn of events that would forever change the course of their relationship. Overhearing disparaging remarks made by Gotti about him, Gravano found himself at a crossroads. In a move that stunned the mafia community, Gravano decided to testify on behalf of the FBI, breaking a blood oath and becoming the highest ranking member of the five families to cooperate with law enforcement. Gravano's decision to aid the feds in taking down Gotti came with its own set of repercussions. Not only did he become a marked man within the Gambino crime family, but he also faced the moral dilemma of betraying the code of silence that had governed the mafia for generations. Gravano's testimony would prove to be a turning point in the fight against organized crime, as it provided crucial evidence that ultimately led to Gotti's downfall. And with Gotti behind bars, the once mighty Gambino crime family was left in disarray. Gravano's actions had shattered the illusion of invincibility that had surrounded Gotti, and the repercussions would be felt throughout the criminal underworld. But what happened to Sammy the Bull Gravano after his pivotal role in taking down John Gotti? As depicted in the Netflix docuseries Get Gotti, John Gotti was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in 1992. Two years later, it was Gravano's turn to face the consequences of his own crimes. Despite his cooperation with the authorities, the former underboss received a five-year prison sentence. While Gravano's testimony against Gotti undoubtedly helped him secure a less severe sentence, his long-standing involvement with the mob and his high-ranking role within the Gambino family did not allow him to evade prison entirely. It is important to note that Gravano's confession during his trial revealed his involvement in at least 19 murders. However, compared to other Gambino associates, Gravano received a relatively lenient sentence. At the time of his sentencing, he had already served four years, and in total he spent less than a year more behind bars. Upon his release, Gravano made a significant decision that would shape the next phase of his life. He joined the Witness Protection Program, a government initiative designed to provide new identities and protection to individuals who cooperate with law enforcement. The program aimed to keep Gravano safe from potential retaliation by his former associates in the Gambino crime family. However, Gravano's time in the Witness Protection Program was short-lived. Roughly a decade after the Gotti trial, he found himself in trouble with the law once again. Gravano was arrested on federal and state drug charges, which led to his sentencing to approximately 20 years in prison. He served his time concurrently in both New York and Arizona, facing the consequences of his involvement in drug trafficking rings. It is worth noting that Gravano's reputation as an underboss who ordered hits for years did not work in his favor during parole hearings. Despite serving substantial time for his mob-related activities, he did not spend nearly the same amount of time in prison for his involvement in drug trafficking. Nevertheless, his release came a few years earlier than expected, leaving many to question the justice system's handling of his case. In 2017, after nearly two decades behind bars, Sammy the Bull Gravano was finally released from prison. Although he had served substantial time for his involvement in drug trafficking rings in both New York and Arizona, his sentence for his mob-related activities was comparatively shorter. However, it was widely known that Gravano, as an underboss, had ordered hits for years, adding to the intrigue surrounding his release. Following his release, Gravano faced a new chapter in his life. He had to navigate the challenges of re-entering society after spending a significant portion of his life in the criminal underworld. Despite his past, Gravano sought to reinvent himself and leave his criminal activities behind. In 2020, Sammy the Bull Gravano embarked on a new venture that surprised many. He started a podcast and a YouTube channel called Our Thing, where he shares his experiences and insights. This bold move allowed Gravano to showcase his transition from a life of organized crime to a new public persona. A lot of the things Things that I have spoken about so far have been mentioned and even touched upon in Get Gotti, but the docuseries failed to give these topics the detail they deserved. They are integral aspects of John Gotti's story, and it is interesting that Netflix chose to hide these aspects of the overall narrative. And that's our video. If you liked what you saw, check one of these out too. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.